I uncovered a rigid framework that all movies follow, with no exceptions. This video will break down how even Enola Holmes 2 adheres to Hollywood's storytelling secret. Check out the videos tab to see if your favorite movie has been exposed. We start as always with a focus on our protagonist, specifically their personality, their inner conflict, and their situation. Enola indulges in her detective ambitions like the gentleman classics, but she's forever overshadowed by big brother Sherlock. She rejects her obvious feelings for Tewksbury to focus on her career, and her first official case enters her office, the disappearance of Sarah Chapman. Next, we examine where, why, and how our protagonist exists in their world, with a focus on why they don't quite fit in. Enola's privileged upbringing contrasts against how the other half lives, and she's even discounted by her fellow women who see her as an outsider, while she takes in a handful of random clues toward the overall mystery. Then a brief event happens, one that's never happened before. It's destined to lead all the characters away from their status quo. Enola formally accepts the case from Bessie, promising big results, which leads us to examine the effect of that something new to the status quo, specifically what's different now and what remains the same. Enola experiences the working conditions of the other half, then she takes in the scene and clues to sneak her way into an office and she gathers information and more questions about the disappearance. We move along to the discovery that things are less than ideal, or else we explore how badly things are. Both scenarios are common. Corporate fat cats reveal the presence of a conspiracy and theft, while Typhus runs rampant through the company's workforce. May does a horrible job at hiding her dodginess and obviously knows more. Then Enola discovers her secret second job as a club dancer. Next, our characters dedicate their effort to a specified goal, and this is always narrower in scope than what the third act will demand. Enola questions May about the whereabouts of Sarah, and pulls on a loose thread about a potential suitor of hers, then tries to unravel the overall mystery around her disappearance. Then we run through a brief checklist of the main story elements that we can expect during this journey. The gargoyle presence of Superintendent Grail. Silliness. Lots and lots of silliness. Sherlock and his own mind-numbing case. The Holmes family dynamic, including their game of deductions. And of course, Enola's deepening mystery. Which brings us to the brief event that launches our characters into the wild jungle of the second act. It's also called the Oh Shit Moment. Sherlock accidentally insults Enola, entwining the acceptance of help with desperation. Ah, shit. We follow our characters as they discover the new rules and expectations of their journey. These are always distinct to the narrative at play. Tewksbury and Enola navigate her complicated relationship with relationships. Then she uses periphery conversation to solve a coded message, a Sherlockian classic move, but experiences the dismay at unexpected twists in the case, like a kicked in door. Next, our characters showcase their ability to grow and progress, and this is typically an external or physical beat rather than internal or emotional. Enola receives the next clue in the mystery, then formally meets Grail, explaining the cane limp from earlier, and she's accepted as a detective at face value by all the men in the room. Then our characters face legitimate and understandable reasons to deviate from their stated convictions, agendas, or desires. Enola escapes Grail with evidence in hand, making herself a fugitive. Then the Strahd rats her out to Sherlock. We endure the anxiety as our characters face an escalation of problems and complications. Sherlock explains the details of his own case and reveals that a mysterious person is ahead of him at every step. Enola explains the details of her disappearance case, 
then Sherlock takes it over completely and warns her against becoming like him. Next, our characters evolve internally or emotionally, and they do this by using elements of the plot or story, which they've gathered and learned so far. Enola studies the patriarchy and makes progress in her case, while the disappearance ties into Sherlock's mystery, heightening the stakes for both. Then Enola goes undercover in the lion's den. Then our journey-weary characters come to terms with their ongoing struggles. Moments and elements of the first act are used to gauge their progress. Act 1 fellow female hate returns, now from snooty high society. And Enola doesn't belong here either and can't blend in like Act 1. Mira engages with Enola, a continuation of their Act 1 glance. Then she learns how the upper class plays, a deliberate contrast to the Act 1 poverty which results in a brief event that strikes at our protagonist core conflict. Enola wrangles Tewksbury into the case, finding it easy to accept help from some people, and there's no turning back from here. We receive needed answers alongside our characters, which relate to both their external journeys and their internal conflicts. Enola discusses and even leans into their affections as Tewksbury teaches her to dance. Then she matches William's handwriting and confirms that he is the suitor. Next, our characters complete their narrow scope objective, yet discover that their victory is shallow or altogether meaningless and must complete a wider scope objective. Enola questions William directly about Sarah but he knows more about Sarah than she expected, and Sherlock uncovers more of the overall mystery, but it presents the greater mystery of who is Moriarty. Then Enola is finally in the room with Sarah's suitor, but her arrest stops her from connecting the final dots. Then our characters face an existential conflict that wounds their sense of self and identity or their physical journey. Grail gets violent and calls for Enola to suffer the death penalty, and he stumps Sherlock with evidence that she committed murder. Then Sherlock recruits the help of Edith and the whole underground movement. We celebrate with our protagonist in light of an undeniable win, which is always related to the rebirth in some way. Edith and Eudoria stage a jailbreak to rescue their favorite detective who then confirm everything about Enola's case and deductions, and give her a direction to look into what information to seek. Next, our characters suffer a grand loss, and this is always connected to their newfound inability to quit their journey. Grail catches the trio of chaotic good feminists, and leaves them on foot to finish their escape. Eudoria admits to regretting how lonely her children tend to be, then separates from her daughter again, until Enola Holmes III. Then we experience a thematic freefall, as the main story elements are ramped up and thrown into upheaval. Bessie reminds us of how the other half lives, and her few living options, and Enola pieces together the phosphorus connection to the typhus. She races to Tewksbury for yet more help in the case, then Sicily reappears, reminding us of a conspiracy and need for reform, which forces us into a brief event that robs our protagonist of seemingly any hope of success. Enola realizes that she missed almost everything of importance, and upends her understanding of the entire case. We watch our characters realize that they cannot return to their first act selves, and they turn to face the wider scope objective. Enola deduces the true rebellious motives of William and Sarah, and declares her love openly for Tewksbury. The Holmeses team up in the match factory as their cases collide again, and they deduce the full scope of the overall conspiracy, yet discover that the murder scene has been staged. Next, our characters use the major swings of the story and their personal journeys to move towards the climax. Enola returns the favor of teaching something at the last minute, and both Sarah and Enola recognize one another for their superb detective work. Then Grail intervenes in the matter yet again with a nefarious agenda. 
Then the final confrontation plays out, between our protagonist and characters against the antagonistic force. Everyone brawls, highlighting their strengths and weaknesses, while Enola faces off with Grail, the enforcer of the patriarchy status quo. Then she recalls her Rube Goldberg lessons, which have played a thematic throughline, which culminates in a brief moment where our protagonist finally, and oftentimes metaphorically, overcomes their place in the Act 1 status quo. Enola takes out Grail, stopping the seemingly unstoppable force of the patriarchy's control in this conspiracy. We experience the direct aftermath of the climax. This can give our characters a moment to reflect on the situation, or else wind down the action with a coda. Sherlock's case unravels to reveal the identity of Moriarty, and McIntyre covers the whole thing up, subverting justice for self-preservation. Next, we touch base with additional characters, typically to contrast them against the new status quo. Sarah and Bessie discuss their helplessness in the situation, yet rally the match girls with one voice and the truth. And Eudoria and Edith check in one more time for good measure. Then we conclude with a tight focus on our protagonist, specifically to contrast them against how we met them at the opening. Enola resolves her first case with a happy ending, and reboots her agency in a place that's much more comfortable. She takes her first steps toward a loving relationship with Sherlock, then takes her first steps in romance with Tewksbury. No longer alone. And there you have it. Enola Holmes 2 fits perfectly into Hollywood's storytelling secret. What do you think? Was this an improvement on the already great first entry, or did the sequel rely too heavily on references from the original? I invite all your thoughts and comments below. If you enjoyed this breakdown, you should definitely check out my Cruella video. This double feature would be girl power on Overload, and they're both creatively shot movies to boot. And please, take care of yourselves out there, and I'll talk at you next time.